Good morning. Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 24 says this, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. There's much to groan about and to grieve right now, but we were saved in hope. So I've been thinking of a song by Janine Dryley. It's called, He's an Unchanging Savior. And uh, the beginning of it is really wonderful. The first line says, when the scenes of life shift about us like the backdrops in a play. That's such a vivid picture of how things have felt recently. It's like we're on a stage and every time we turn around, the backdrop is completely different. It's like we're in a whole new a new scene. Things have suddenly changed on us again. So here's, here's how her text goes. When the scenes of life shift about us like the backdrops in a play, were our hope in the things that surround us, in the things that pass away, we should then be full of confusion, without hope, and in dismay. What a joy instead to be anchored to the rock that will ever stay. Then we will press onward, for Christ is still the same. What he was in ages past is what he will remain, and forevermore that is what he will be. He's an unchanging Savior. I love that. We will press onward for Christ is still the same, even when the backdrops and scene seems to keep changing on us. So we gather this morning around the written word so that we might see and know the living word who is our anchor, our rock, our hope. And so this morning we press onward for Christ is still the same couple of announcements before we pray together. There's no video fellowship after the service today because we have an outdoor in-person fellowship this evening. So can't wait to see you there. If you need the information about that, text us and we will get it to you. So there's no video fellowship after the service today because we look forward to seeing you this evening. Next Sunday, June 14th, there will be a video fellowship after the service. Uh, My family and I will be out of town, uh, but Pastor John will be leading that, Lord willing. And then June 21st, so two weeks from today, we'll have another outdoor fellowship in the evening. So throughout June, we'll continue to have our morning preaching online while you gather in small groups to watch that. And then we'll have outdoor fellowships on the evenings of June 7th and June 21st, a video fellowship after the service on June 14th. And then on Sunday evening, June 28th, we're looking forward to our first in-person service together, a Lord's Supper service that evening, Sunday, June uh, 28th. So that's what we've got through June. Then we're working very hard to try to nail down a location to be able to move towards Sunday morning services sometime in the month of July. We've got some options and are excited about that possibility coming together here soon. Thank you to our facility team uh, for all of their work on that. So my family is uh, scheduled to be gone from June 9 through 19. uh, So please be aware that I'll be away from phone and computer and so forth uh, for most of that time. All right, let's pray together before we uh, sing to the Lord. Father, we are grateful this morning to be able to press onward because Christ is still the same. There is a rock beneath our feet and we stand in grace. And so I pray that you might just tune our hearts to sing your grace right now. Just uh, loose us from the weights that have pulled upon us so much this week and, and free our tongues to praise you and our hearts to rejoice in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. How should we worship in times like these? How does the Bible help us know how to worship? Well, in times of national difficulty, sorrow, tragedy, violence, loss, God's word directs our thoughts and gives us words to worship with in the Psalms of Lament. As Christians, we should know how to truly rejoice through suffering better than anyone and also how to truly grieve about suffering 
better than anyone. That's because we know that the way to do both of those things is to focus on God. We find our true peace and joy in him, and we direct our sorrows and laments to him. So this morning, we're going to begin with a psalm of lament, Psalm 74. I'm going to ask you to take these inspired words into your own mouth. So as we did last week, please read aloud together those lines on your screen that are in bold. How long, O God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Yet, God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You split open springs and brooks, You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Have regard for the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Let not the drought downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause. I love that line, my king is from of old. We ask, how long, O Lord? And, And that's a time question. But we're asking the one who is outside of time. He made time. He built the sun. He made the seasons. And he has already won the future battle. So in our lament, let's sing about that certainty and that hope. We're going to start with, this is my father's world. Uh, one morning this week, as I was reflecting on Psalm 74, uh, I wrote a stanza for this hymn a new second stanza, and it's a lament, just like Psalm 74, and it's designed to connect the first verse to the third verse. So uh, when we get to that second verse, you can sing along, or uh, since it's unfamiliar, you may just want to listen and read along. But let's sing, This is My Father's World. Who 
So now, let's continue singing to our Father, who is the King of old. Let's sing the gospel, the the ancient song of God's plan of redemption for his world. Let's sing the story of how he made all things good, but through our disobedience, we chose death and fell from life. So the creator became one of us and chose obedience unto death in our place, and then rose to life. Let's sing the gospel. Oh, sing, my soul. Oh, sing, my soul, the ancient song, and land your highest praise to him who is the king of old and dwells in endless days how resplendent his glory how majestic his name now to the uncreated one oh let the anthem raise oh worship Our Father God, the Spirit and the Word, who fashioned all things from his joy and saw that it was good. What perfection of friendship, what communion we share. But choosing death, we fell from life aside the guilty pair. How did he respond to that? Now hear my soul the gospel song, attend the joyful news. For Christ has come, the perfect Son, his Father's will to choose. In our place he did suffer, in our place became sin. The death of death, the death of Christ, who stands alive again. alone be our treasure, Christ alone our reward. Come bid the nations sing with us the praises of the Lord. In just a few minutes, we're going to sing our song of the month that we started last week, His Mercy is More. But before that, we'll read scripture together. The text will be on the screen, but if you'd like to turn in your Bible, it's 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, We're going to go back to having serial scripture readings like we have done for the last several years on Sunday mornings. Uh, My hope is that this will be another small kind of normal for us as we move towards gathering together again for services soon. I looked it up and we started reading through the Gospel of Mark 15 months ago. Uh, We didn't quite finish, but we'll actually save the end of that for later. And for the next few weeks, we'll be reading in 1 Peter. uh, Because 1 Peter is a letter of encouragement and exhortation written to Christians who were experiencing suffering. It's addressed to those of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, They were exiled because of persecution, and so part of their suffering was separation. And there's really no fair comparison between their suffering and our situation, but perhaps, as Pastor Tim has reminded us recently, we can identify a little better with passages like these now. And regardless, this letter is 
written for us. So this morning, maybe we can imagine that it's addressed to those who are elect exiles in Menifee, Marietta, Nuevo, Elsinore, Temecula, Wildemar, Escondido, and Riverside. I probably missed somewhere in there, but you get the point. This is for us. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. His mercy is great, greater than our sin. We're going to sing our new song of the month now, Our Sins, They Are Many, but his mercy is more. And then right after that, we'll sing, I'm born again. I'm God's own chosen child of mercy. We actually sang that song just about a month ago, but it's based on 1 Peter. And so this is the perfect time for us to sing it again. Let's sing together about our Father's mercy. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy. Stood neath a debt we could 
could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness through every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more Sanctified by his own spirit, praise the Holy Three in one. Saved by resurrection power, shielded in his faithful love. Now no enemy can tarnish my inheritance above. I'm born again. I'm God's own chosen child of mercy, born again. What love and grace, Father, keep me walking worthy till I look upon your face, till I look upon your face. Led by by many trials below, yet rejoicing in his purpose that my faith as gold may glow. Granted faith for overcoming, filled with love for Christ unseen. Even angels cannot fathom what salvation God will bring. I'm born again, I'm God's own chosen child of mercy, born again, what love and grace, Father keep me walking worthy, till I look upon your face, till I look upon Christ, the sure foundation, we are free from guilt and shame. He is fitting us to gather as a house to praise his name. We are chosen as God's people, called from darkness into light. Oh, what mercy now entreats us to proclaim glory's bright. I'm born again. I'm God's own chosen child of mercy. Born again. What love and grace. Father, keep me walking worthy till I look upon your face. Till I look upon Take your Bible now, and let's turn back to Romans chapter 12, uh, continuing our study of that chapter this morning. Uh, two weeks ago, we studied verses 1 and 2, and then um, last Sunday, verses 3 through 8, and now this morning, we're going to start into a two-part study of verses 9 through uh, 21. 
So let's just begin by reading through that text. If you've got your Bible, Romans 12, and we're going to read verses 9 through 21 together. Romans 12, 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This section is about genuine love for all men. Of course, when we started studying Romans 12 three weeks ago, I didn't have any idea of how the scene would change for us again uh, once we got into this chapter and the events that would unfold of these last couple weeks. But God knew, and I'm so glad he, in his wisdom, has brought us to this text about genuine love uh, right now at this time. Um, Right now, we we're at a time when we need to look out at big picture issues and, and national news and, and think through what's really going on and what's behind these things and all of that. We need awareness of those things and we need to be able to pray and we need to know what our responsibilities are as citizens. So I know it's a time when those things are important. But we can get stuck with our focus on what is out there, on the big national things, when in reality, the primary impact of your life is going to happen back here in a fairly small circle of in-person relationships that you have. That's where we actually make our biggest impact is, is one relationship at a time. I'm not saying you shouldn't pay attention to what's going on in the big picture and have some focus out on those things and pray and be involved, but we can't get stuck out there. I, I brought a camera with me this morning uh, to try to illustrate this. This is from about 1955. This is a, a Polaroid, one of the earliest Polaroids from the day when, you know, instant pictures were an amazing, amazing thing. And uh, this camera, you you pull out the bellows like this, and then once it's out here, you you adjust the focus by sliding it. You actually slide the bellows back and forth. The movement's not a lot, so I know it's not a whole lot to see. It only goes a couple of inches, but hopefully you can see there that I'm I'm bringing it forward, and then I'm and I'm bringing it back. There's actually a little distance scale that I can look at here to help me focus. Now, if you're a camera buff, you you know that as we go out, we focus closer, and as we come back in, we focus farther away. But can we just ignore that for a moment <laughs> for the sake of my illustration? What I'm trying to illustrate here is that on a camera like this, you cannot focus on what is far away and what is close at the same time. You've got this physical thing. You've got to slide back and forth to, to choose where you want to focus. And so either you, you go out and you focus far away or you come back and you focus up close, but it's one or the other. You've got to pick where you're going to focus. And as I think about that, I think that our lives can be that same way. We, we can get out where we're looking and focusing out at those things that are far away, the big national events, even global things that are going on. And it's good for us to look at those things. But we need to make sure we don't get stuck out there. And I, actually, I had one of these cameras before this one, a very similar one. And I'd never had one of these before, and I didn't quite know how it worked. And the first time I opened it, when I pulled this, when I pulled this out, I pulled it out too far and it got stuck all the way out. And I actually had to take the whole inside p- things apart uh, to get it unstuck and to get it to go back into the camera. You know, that's what the media wants to do to you because they make their money off of keeping your attention on those big things that are out there. They want to keep your attention stuck all the way out. 
And, and it's, again, it's not bad for us to spend some of our time and attention knowing about those things and praying about those things, but we can't get stuck out there. We have to then come back to our actual circle of in-person relationships with people we know, because that's where genuine love really gets carried out. And so Romans 12, I think, is very helpful for us at this time, because while I encourage you to keep up with the big issues and pray, this text brings our focus back to genuine love for the people in our current relationships. That's where you're going to have your biggest impact. Now, before we get into any of the details here, let's remember that this section of Romans 12, and really all of Romans 12 through 16, are are describing our response to the gospel. Nothing in these verses is just about some generic trying to become a better person. Everything here is a response to what God has done for us through Christ. Remember Romans 1 through 11, teach us about God's saving work through Christ. And then Romans 12, 1 and 2, teach that because of God's amazing mercy in the gospel, we should present our whole life to him so that we, he can renew our mind and transform us in line with his will. That's true worship, right? And then after Romans 12, 2, the rest of the book gives us snapshots and explanations and illustrations of a gospel life. So here in our paragraph, verses 9 through 21, genuine love is characteristic of a gospel life. The way the Greek grammar is really structured in this section, um, it suggests that everything in verses 9 through 21 supports that opening phrase, let love be genuine. This whole section describes genuine love. And the principles here about genuine love apply to all men and women. We should love everyone like this However, Paul does specifically direct our attention to two groups of people. First, he puts a special emphasis on loving our church family, and then he also emphasizes loving our enemies. So we should love everyone like these verses describe, but he especially points our attention to our church family and to our enemies, and we'll focus on the enemies part next Sunday in verses 17 through 21. Now, I'm sure you noticed that as we read verses 9 through 21, it it feels like you're getting hit by a Nerf shotgun. Like, all this is coming at you at once. In, In 13 verses, there are at least two dozen different principles about genuine love. There's so much that comes so fast, it's really hard to figure out how to preach on a passage like this, because there's so much to it. So, is Paul just being random? Or does anything unify this together in verses 9 through 21? Well, I'm going to mention three answers, and um, two of them we've actually talked about already. First of all, everything in verses 9 through 21 is a response to the mercies of God. You can take each principle here, the, the two dozen principles, and you can ask, how does this remind me of the gospel? And how is this a response to the gospel? So, for example let love be genuine. How does that remind you of the gospel? Has God shown his genuine love for you by sending Christ? Yeah. His love for us is perfectly pure and fully complete and eternally endless. Nothing is more genuine than that. So we respond to his mercies, his genuine love, by extending genuine love to others. So so this whole section reminds us of the gospel and is a response to the gospel. That means that you can't read verses 9 through 21 and think of it like a to-do list for how to be a better person. you got to read this as a rich reminder of what God has done for you in Christ. It's not a checklist for self-improvement. It's a reminder of how the gospel changes our relationships. Similarly, you don't need to think of this as a giant list of things that you've got to try to remember how to do. If you really are rejoicing in God's mercy to you and and filling your heart with Christ every day, then genuine love is going to pour out of your heart. You don't you don't you don't put genuine love on your to-do list like it's a task you got to get accomplished each day. It it flows out of a gospel heart. Okay? So one thing that unifies verses 9 through 21 is that it's a response to the mercies of God. Another thing that unifies it is that everything in these verses is related to relationships. Two-thirds of the principles here are directly stated as being for relationships, 
and the other one third are all indirectly about relationships. So really the whole section is about gospel living in our relationships. The gospel should change how you think and feel about other people's blessings, sufferings, tears, weaknesses, economic or social status, the ways they're different from you, the mean things they do to you, and the ways they hurt you. Paul touches on all of those issues here. You'll know the gospel is really transforming you when it transforms how you think and feel about other people. John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. So everything in verses 9 through 21 is a response to God's mercy. Everything is about relationships. And then finally, as we've already seen, everything in verses 9 through 21 illustrates genuine love. The whole section is a guide to genuine love. So let's get into it now. And uh, let's just start with that phrase in verse 9, let love be genuine. We could also use the word sincere. Gospel love is not fake. It's not put on. Now, isn't that obvious? I mean, do we really need Paul to give us two dozen characteristics of genuine love? Well, we do need it for a couple reasons. One, the world is confused about love. Remember, Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Let love be genuine. And what that tells you is that if you are conformed to the world, your love won't be genuine because worldly love isn't genuine. It is insincere, and we can be conformed to that. So that's one reason why we do need Paul to teach us about genuine love. And then a second reason is because our own hearts uh, tend toward insincere love. John Calvin said it this way, It is difficult to express how ingenious almost all men are in counterfeiting a love which they do not really possess. I got to confess how frequently I am more concerned about appearing to be loving than actually being loving. So we do need this long list of principles, this long list of illustrations of genuine love, because genuine love is scarce both in the world and in our hearts sometimes. But there's also an encouragement there, because if genuine love is scarce like that, that makes it really powerful when it's present. That makes it a really shining light in the darkness. So that's why our title today is The Powerful Testimony of Genuine Love for All Men. Because genuine love is so rare, then when it's seen, it stands out. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, your life of genuine love, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Genuine love is a powerful testimony to the transformational power of the gospel. This is especially true when that genuine love is for all men. See the end of verse 17? Do what is honorable in the sight of all. And the end of verse 18? Live peaceably with all. And verse 20? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Gospel love is for everyone, including your enemies. Matthew 5.44, Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Right after Jesus told us to love our enemies, he said in verse 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? He's not saying that it's wrong to love those who love you. Of course we should love them. But genuine love also loves others beyond just those who love us in return. Genuine love is a powerful and distinct testimony because it loves all men the powerful testimony of genuine love for all men. All right, let's look through uh, the rest of verses 9 through 16 now. So the end of verse 9, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Those two, strongs are, those, those two terms are very strong. Abhor and hold fast. Now, how is this a response to the gospel? Jesus died on the cross because God hates what is evil, and God judges evil. 
God sent his son to rescue us from evil and bring all that is good into our lives. So a life transformed by the gospel will hate evil and cling very tightly to good. A a mind being renewed into the image of Christ will will respond to evil with hatred and respond to good by, by loving it and being drawn to it. That probably seems simple, yet we tend to love things we shouldn't love. That's why John has to write to us, don't love the world. And why James has to say to us, you adulterous people, don't you realize that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Is your heart drawn to some things that God hates? So when we hear Paul say, abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good, that shouldn't just be in one ear and out the other. We should say, oh God, help me. God, change me. Forgive me for loving things I shouldn't love. You came to destroy evil, yet I sometimes love it. So, oh, would you forgive me and, 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 and renew me to be like Jesus? Okay, so, so abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. That relates to the gospel, for Jesus came to deal with evil. But how does it relate to our relationships in this section about genuine love? Why, why does Paul say, let's talk about genuine love. First thing, abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Why is that the first thing he says? And you know, I don't, I don't know for sure, but my guess is that Paul knows he's going to, he's going to press us very earnestly to love everyone, including evil people. And so I, I wonder if he wants to make sure we don't misinterpret that to mean that we need to embrace and support the evil things that people do. We've got to love and serve everyone, including evil people who do evil things, but we can't ever love the evil that they do. We have to abhor it. And that's very relevant for our culture today in which love is defined as accepting and even promoting things that God would say are evil. So we've got to love all people, including evil people, but we can't ever start to love evil itself. All right, so that's verse 9. Now verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Uh, That's a call to love one another like we love each other in our families. Genuine love has the warmth and commitment of family love. Now, obviously, families can hate one another and homes can be places of terrible conflict, but there is a unique love of family members for one another and a unique commitment that can be stronger than almost any other type of love. And so God is telling us that we should love one another with that that good and very strong kind of family love. We should seek to love everyone like this, but Paul particularly has in mind here our relationships in the church. In the church, love one another with family love. Um, That's our response to the gospel, right? Because Jesus brought us into God's family through his death for us. God wanted us to be his children. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers, so... Love one another with brotherly affection. And then verse 10 continues, outdo one another in showing honor. Now, is that a response to the gospel? Should I honor you because God has honored me? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because uh, the word honor refers to giving weight or value to something. And when the Bible says that we were bought with a price, it uses that same word honor God paid the greatest price for us, the price of his son. And so 1 Peter 2, uh, beginning in verse 4, it says that we are living stones in God's house, and we're built on the foundation of Christ, this precious cornerstone. And it says that whoever believes in him will not be put to shame, which is the opposite of honor. And then it says, verse 7, 1 Peter 2, 7, that there is honor for those who believe. So rather than shame, God gives us honor. Our sin is shameful, but Jesus took the shame on the cross, and that gives us honor. So because we have received honor from God, now we give honor to other people. And and that's not just because we have received it in salvation. It's also because they're created in his image. So we have this double reason to give honor to other people. Genuine love honors other people. You know, that... I was just reading to you from 1 Peter 2. That's where it says that God honors us. That same chapter is where he goes on to talk about government. And at the end of his section about government and society, he says, 1 Peter 2, 17, honor everyone. 
Consider every human being as being precious and valuable, created in the image of God, and, and pass along to them the same kind of honor that God has shown to you, despite the fact that you are a sinner. Honor everyone, Peter says. So then back here in Romans 12, what he says is, outdo one another in showing honor. So that's, he's particularly talking about life in the church family, and genuine love in the church is not concerned about honoring myself or getting people to think I'm valuable and important, but it's, it's concerned with honoring others and making sure that they know I think they're valuable and important, and most importantly, God thinks they're valuable and important. So outdo one another in showing honor. Now, verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Jesus, he came with zeal for the truth, zeal for God's glory, zeal for you and your salvation. He was fervent in his spirit and he was fervent in the Holy Spirit, which is probably the idea here. And he came to serve. He was zealous, fervent, and a servant. So to be zealous, fervent, and servant-hearted in your love is to be like Jesus, to reflect how Jesus has loved you. It's how we respond to him. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So we respond to the mercies of God with zealous and fervent service. And it connects directly to our relationships. We should be zealous and fervent in our relationships because we serve the Lord by serving others. So that's why John says, don't just love in word or in talk, love in deed and in truth. Serve the Lord by serving other people. Genuine love is love in action. It's zealous. It's, it's fervent to serve. See, slothfulness is not loving. Laziness is not loving. Genuine love plans how to serve others. So are you zealous and fervent in response to God's zealous and fervent love for you? Uh, we have different personalities. Our personalities have different intensities and uh, we have different volumes. <laughs> but we can all be zealous and fervent as we serve the Lord by loving others. That's gospel living. Now, verse 12 Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Let's start with rejoice in hope. Will you turn with me back to Romans 5? Um, I want us to just read a couple of these key sections of Romans. And there's just, there's so much hopelessness right now, at least as the media is portraying it. Um, but what about you? Are you joining in the flavor of the day, the hopeless mood of the day? Or is your life demonstrating hope? Gospel living is hope-filled living. And so I, you know, we can't turn this into a sermon on hope, but let's just read a couple of the key sections in Romans. Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then over to Romans chapter 8. And we'll read again Romans 8 verses 18 through 25. Romans 8, 18 for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. 
Now, hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Yeah, we're having to wait in patience right now, but in hope, we have been saved. So this is a gospel response, rejoicing in hope. But now what does it have to do with relationships? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love hopes all things. When we slide into gloom and doom and despair, we also drift away from loving others. Love is fueled by hope. And so if you want to be genuinely loving in your relationships, you're going to have to have your heart anchored in gospel hope. Rejoice in hope. Verse 12, uh, back, back to Romans 12 now. And verse 12 continues, be patient in tribulation. So again, we could think of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, love bears all things. That's a gospel response because God has borne with us. (laughs) He's been patient with us. And that same God is working together all of our tribulations for good. We know the end of the story. We know that these sufferings are going to result in an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So we can be patient. We can endure. And, And we might need to endure financial hardships and physical hardships. But oftentimes what requires more endurance than anything else is people. We could handle the finances or the pains, but oh, the people are so hard. So that phrase, be patient in tribulation in verse 12, that's about relationships too. Remember how patient God has been with us. And then finally, verse 12 says, be constant in prayer. Paul knows how hard all this is. With men, this is impossible. So he reminds us to never stop praying. Hard relationships call for constant prayer. Genuine love calls for constant prayer. All right, verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Genuine love is genu- generous. You know, there's that section in 1 John chapter 3 where uh, John talks about how you can't possibly claim to love if you see the needs of others and are content to say, oh, that's fine, go on your way, you know, hope somebody takes care of you. God's love can't possibly abide in you if you're that cold-hearted, John says. And just before that, he writes this, 1 John 3, verse 16, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So contribute to the needs of the saints. Do that first. And then as you have opportunity, contribute to the needs of all men. Obviously, we are very limited. We can't begin to, you know, fix global, global poverty ourselves or or meet the needs of everyone. But in the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus taught us that our neighbor is whomever God brings into our path who has needs that we could meet, even if they're from a very different ethnicity than our own. God brings them into our path, then contribute to their needs. So contribute to the needs of the saints, contribute to the needs of your neighbors, whomever God brings into your path. The gospel is a story of God's divine generosity toward us. And so gospel living is a generous life toward others. Now, verse 13, seek to show hospitality. Seek to show hospitality. Um, The word hospitality refers to welcoming strangers. That's the idea, welcoming strangers. Um, Showing hospitality was so important in the ancient world because travel was so difficult. And um, hospitality would, could be very costly, uh, especially for you know, farmers and people who are just kind of living on each day's income. To have somebody, other people in your house could be very costly. And it was also dangerous. I mean, we know that uh, at, in the first century, like traveling Jews would carry letters of recommendation with them so that people would have some idea of who these strangers are that I'm letting into uh, my home. So hospitality was costly. Hospitality was dangerous, but hospitality was very important. So Paul says we should seek to show hospitality. Seek ways to welcome strangers. Try to figure out ways to do that. Plan how you could do that. This, this isn't just about inviting friends over for a meal um, or letting someone spend the night. It's about a heart attitude that is open to new people, 
open to people who are different from us, open to strangers, rather than being closed off in self-protectiveness. Seek to be welcoming to strangers is what seek to show hospitality means. Now, uh, verse 14, we're going to include next Sunday. So let's go to verse 15 now. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Uh, Paul's probably thinking especially of relationships in the local church, like 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26. If one member suffers, all the members suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice uh, together. But when you when you get involved with a church family in a biblical way, you're joining yourself together with them so that their joys become your joys and their sorrows become your sorrows. And that's risky, but it's beautiful because Jesus came and bore our griefs and carried our sorrows all the way to death on a cross. So how beautiful it is then when we are willing to join together in both the joys and the sorrows of the body of Christ. That, that kind of opening yourself up to other people like that is genuine love. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Well, right now the world is asking, why can't we live in harmony with one another? And they're supposed to be able to look at Christian churches and see Christian churches as places where true harmony happens among diverse people. John 13, verse 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So a great way to pursue cultural harmony is to pursue local church harmony. And as we practice living out harmony in the local church, we can then take steps to try to extend it out to others. Now you can't, there's no way to perfectly have harmony among people who aren't reconciled to God. But we can still reach out in ways that demonstrate that we're seeking to live in harmony with everyone while we pray that they'll be reconciled to God, because then true harmony will really be possible. Live in harmony with one another. Now, what are the barriers to harmony? Um, We could list a lot of things. I mean, probably the easiest thing that comes to mind is just our different views and opinions. And Paul's going to talk about that a lot in Romans 14 and 15. But here in Romans 12, he actually points to another barrier to harmony. It's in the middle of verse 16. See, verse 16 says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Our pride that sometimes um, thinks that certain types of people are lower than us That's a major barrier to harmony, and that's what Paul's addressing here. As Dr. Robert Mounts writes, the admonition is to get off one's high horse and come to grips with reality. There are both humble tasks and ordinary people who need our attention. To withdraw from either is to allow pride to control our lives. It's a big problem when we view any type of people as being below us. Genuine love is not ashamed to love anyone and serve anyone, and be associated with anyone. It does not think of itself as being in a class above. To think that way would contradict the gospel itself. First of all, because we're all created in the image of God. Second of all, we're all sinners who, are in, who need a Savior. And thirdly, the glorious Son of God in heaven was willing to condescend to live among us and die for us. So don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. And then verse 16 ends, never be wise in your own sight. Pride is a barrier to genuine love. It's a barrier to healthy relationships. It makes us obnoxious and difficult to get along with. Uh, Leanne Morris wrote that the person who is wise in his own eyes is rarely so in the eyes of other people. If I am wise in my own sight, it will be hard for anybody to get along with me. It will be hard for me to genuinely love others because I will be um, pushing them away with my proud attachment to my own opinions. 
R.C. Sproul observed that we just assume that anybody that disagrees with us must be wrong. And Douglas Moo says that this leads us to think that we are always right and others wrong, and that our opinions matter more than others. So Dr. Sproul writes again, humility is to be able to listen to people and give an honest hearing and consideration to what they are saying. Humility can unlock relationships. And gratefully, the gospel produces that kind of humility in us as it transforms us. The gospel shows us our own foolishness and God's great wisdom. And so hopefully, as we are transformed by the gospel, we trust our own wisdom less and less, and we trust God's wisdom more and more. And that just makes us easier to be around. It just makes us better in relationships, because then we can listen to others and respect others and and have relationships of genuine love for others. So never be wise in your own sight. That will really get in the way of genuine love. All right, um, I'm out of time for this week, so I'm going to save the conclusion for next Sunday when we're going to continue with part two of this. Um, So I want to just simply say this as we finish today. Uh, Remember, this in Romans 12, 9 through 21, is not a a to-do list. These are examples of the genuine love that flows out of our hearts when we understand all of God's mercy to us. It's not a Christian checklist. It's a description of a life being transformed by the gospel. And so uh, I'm sure that if you have a tender heart, you are, you are seeing areas of weakness and failure as we study these things. And the answer is not just to determine to do better. Um, the answer is to go back to the gospel and say, or ask yourself, why is there a disconnect between... Um, the gospel and my heart toward other people. Why am, I, why am I hesitant to treat other people as God has treated me? So you go back to the cross and we seek a, a renewed mind and a renewed heart because we know that will transform our life and that will transform our love so that we will genuinely love all men. And we know that that will be a powerful testimony to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, please don't let this seed sown be snatched away or, checked out, or, or choked out. This is such an incredible passage for a time like our days right now. And so please sink your truths deeply into our hearts um, with all the conviction that we need, exposing our sinful lack of love. But don't just leave us exposed and convicted. Bring us to the cross and, and through seeing your genuine love there, compel us to, to joyfully love others because of the mercies of God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.